So I'm going to go ahead and just start where I left off last week. And by doing that, I'm just going to go back and grab my SculptGL file. One second. So to do that, let me clear my scene first. There we are. One sec, let me mess with my audio. Let's try that as well. Go ahead. Um, what I'm going to do at this point is go ahead and go ahead and add my old scene file, which is this goblin.sgl. Okay, audio is a little off. One second. We're going to do some audio troubleshooting here as well, so if you're uh, tuning in, well, just bear with me for one second. But I went ahead and opened my scene file, and this was the same goblin file that we were working on last week. So this is kind of the start of the base here. Um, and what I'm going to do, try to do this week is do less of the actual modeling on the object and do more of the um, posing and setting it up for 3D printing. So right now, if you're interested in learning, learning how we got to this point, you're welcome to go back uh, and view the first tutorial that we went on, which is kind of just the sculpting for it. But now I'm going to kind of go ahead and um, see what we need to do to get it set up for 3D printing, kind of the workflow to follow. The first thing we actually need to do though is last week I talked about how um, he really needs objects in his hands right here. And the reason for that is if you're making something at the scale um, that we're doing right here for like tabletop miniatures, you have to keep in mind that most of these are going to be no more than a couple inches high. So any super fine details, like these fingers that stick out right here, uh, you're going to kind of lose them. Either they're not going to print at all, or they're going to be extremely fragile to the point where it's not realistic to have them. So what we need to do here is kind of model something to fit inside his hand. And in this case, I'm probably going to do a, a quick dagger right here. And then the other one might just be an orb, like on this side. But uh, we're basically going to do these in another application. And then I'm going to come back in here and I'm going to throw them up. So real fast, I can show you how we can get a base started. So you can either start the base here in um, SculptGL or you can start in another program. Um, what I'm going to do here is go ahead and switch over in a second. Yeah, a tabletop goblin, absolutely. Um, so real fast, I'm just going to open my Maya. And while we go ahead and do that, we'll put that up here. While we open that, um, I just kind of want to talk about, you know, kind of the theory behind what I'm doing here. So some other things we need to do uh, to get started along here is things that we're going to do is first off, we need to make the objects, the props that we're going to put in his hand. In this case, um, like I said, the dagger and whatnot. We need to pose him, because right now, although he is per perfectly serviceable, it's a very boring pose that he's been put into. Um, when you start with the modeling, you want to take advantage of symmetry for as long as you can, but you also want to kind of break that at some point and create like an actual posed model, uh, something that's in a somewhat dynamic pose, because you don't want to just have him T-posing you know, like on the middle of your field uh, or whatever use you're going to use him for. If you want to have, you know, like a bunch of T-posed characters, that's totally fine and that's up to you. But um, we're going to try to give him a more dynamic pose before we go in. And then the last thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to add bases to them and then also how to um, prepare them for 3D printing. Because there's a couple things you'll probably need to do before you go into 3D print a model um, that you can think of. If your model is small enough, you may not need to chop off their arms and legs, um, but if you, especially if you have a bigger model, you'll probably want to print those elements separately. Oh, see. Um, so you're asking um, if I drew the face and then shrunk it down? So what I did, this is all one mesh, um, is kind of the basis. So if you go in, you can see the wireframe that I have here. 
Uh, sometimes I do. Um, one thing I mentioned last week is that um, is that sometimes I uh, take the head off, like I cut the head off and keep them as two separate objects. And the reason for that is the face needs the most detail and the body actually needs a lot less detail. Um, you just don't need to get as in depth with it. Um, so you can like cut the head off and then import it on there and merge everything together. But for this one, I chose just to um, keep them all as one object just for kind of showcasing it. Let's see. I did use a base mesh um, when I was starting it. So I started with a base here, but um, most of the sculpting was done in the last session. Okay, so first things first is I want to show you, um, take you kind of into a different route for uh, ways that you can sculpt and create props. I wouldn't even say sculpt because what we're going to do now with hard surface stuff, um, I wouldn't really call sculpting. I would call it modeling at this point. So real fast, let me go ahead and transition our screen share over here. <laughs> Cutting off heads, chopping off arms and legs. Let's see, well, it's all in the name of creation. So real fast, I'm gonna go ahead and transition into Maya. Uh, I use Maya for the most part for modeling purposes because it's what I learned on, but most of what I'm gonna show you here um, is interchangeable across most modeling applications, most surface modelers. Um, so if you were interested in doing something like a software like Blender, which I wholeheartedly recommend, Blender's a great software, or 3ds Max or Modo, uh, any of those kind of packages where you're doing more artistic um, surface-based modeling, um, the workflow is going to be very similar across all of them. A few tools might be different, but you're going to be using the same like extrusions and the same kind of uh, basis for your modeling. So if I'm starting in this screen just to kind of make a basic dagger, usually the first thing I begin with is one of two things. I usually begin with a simple cube or a simple plane, um, depending on what I'm making. And the reason for that is it's very easy to start by mapping out a 2D object. Uh, it's very easy to start by mapping out a 2D object and then making that object 3D and tweaking it from there. And just like we did with our sculpt, we want to be kind of as simple uh, as we can be to start with, and then we can get more complex and add more detail as we go along. I think with this one, I'm going to go ahead and start with a plane. So what it's going to do is create it on the middle of the screen right here. And I'm going to go into my channel box right here. Um, you have all your inputs for when something is first created and you've got all these subdivisions. Honestly, I don't need them. So what I'm going to do is just turn them down to zero. So now I just have one basic plane. I'm going to drag it up a little bit so we can tell what we're looking at. If I was doing this off of stream right now, I would actually be grabbing a lot of reference um, for the kind of dagger that I wanted to make, you know, kind of find a picture of what I wanted to do. But um, because I'm working with two screens as is and I can't, it's harder for me to share that reference with you on screen. I'm just going to kind of be winging it here from my imagination. So in Maya, if you hit spacebar, you can see a top side and uh, front and left view. So I'm going to go into my top view real fast. And I'm going to just kind of start laying out the basics of the object that I want to create. Do, 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 do. Real fast, my symmetry is on. I'm going to turn it off for this. Okay. So by default, when you're kind of starting in this modeling phase, the first thing I really want is an outline. So what I'll start doing is I'll grab one of my edges along here, and I'm going to start extruding it out. So basically, I'm going to grab this and basically I'm just pulling these plane and just grabbing the vertices as I go along. And what this is going to give me the ability to do is as soon as I get enough to work with, I can go in here, right click, and I can start grabbing vertices and dragging them. And this is where I can really start, you know, to shape the object I want to make. So like, let's say that this is the blade right here. I can start grabbing these and pulling them into like a knife shape. Something like this. Sharpen up the edge a little bit. Um, you generally want to stick to quads if you're modeling uh, like this, uh, just because they're easier to work with, and I'll show you why in a second. You can kind of cheat and turn a quad into a triangle if you want by grabbing the vert, 
and just putting it like this. So that's still a quad, you know, for all intents and purposes. It has four sides, and four points, but you can make give it the appearance of a triangle if you need like edges or anything like that. So real here, right here, I'm just placing vertices, kind of finding the shape I want to use. Um, if I want to make any broad changes, I can always use my scale tools. You know, if I just need to lengthen everything uniformly, I can lengthen them that way um, until I kind of get the general idea. Something that I use a lot of in Maya is the subdivision preview or the smooth mesh preview. Um, so basically, if I hit three on my keyboard, it's going to show me an example of what this mesh would look like if it was smoothed. And since I'm probably am going to smooth it, um, my polygon count does not matter because I'm going to be printing this. It's not for real time or anything like that. Um, I may check in with this every so often to make sure everything is smoothing correctly. So that looks good. What I'll do now is I'm going to create another plane just underneath it. Same thing. We're going to turn off all the subdivisions, scale them down to zero, and I'm going to just kind of go in and make the hilt. So this is going to be pretty basic. Um, the main thing is just to kind of show you how I would go about making weapons and then kind of like how you can go from here. And this is a good way to get started. The hilt needs even less geometry than the blade does because really um, it's a simple, you know, like kind of knife that we're working with. So it's just going to have kind of a square blocky hilt. You can make anything as ornate as you need to, but just for the purposes of this example, I'm just going to kind of keep things basic because it doesn't, it doesn't really need to be that complicated. I'm just going to think about how this looks. Yeah, something like this. We'll line this up a little bit more. Perfect. I think that's fine. And then what we're going to do is I'm going to take it back to the perspective mode so I can show you uh, kind of what the next step will be. Uh, so to go from here, basically what you can do is grab your whole mesh and you can extrude it. If you're looking for it, I believe that's under... Yeah, edit mesh, extrude. Um, I'm pretty, I'm pretty well versed in Maya hotkeys by this point. I'm using the control E, but you can find it right there if you're looking for it. When you do this, you're going to get an indicator that looks up, that uh, pops up. You can tell it's different because you have this blue ring around it, and then it gives you a full menu. You can use the thickness uh, slider if you want to control the extrusion, but I usually just grab the indicators and scale it up however much I need. So maybe something like this. Right now we're just giving it a little bit of thickness and the same thing with our handle. Again, it doesn't have to be super ornate right now. The idea here is not to put detail. That would come at a later step. But um, it is just to kind of get the very basic shape of what you're looking for first. And then we can go from there. So just looking at it as a whole, you can tell, you know, like that maybe I want a little more length on this handle. So it fits a little better in his hand. Looks good. And then from here, what you want to do is this is a very <laughs> this is a very dull edge at this point. So what I can do, I'm gonna go ahead and pull this handle off so I can look at this by itself. You can also use the um, hide functions up in here if you go under display. You've got a couple of options. You have hide and show, hide selection, hide unselected objects. I also use these a lot um, because basically I can grab what I want to look at, hide everything that wasn't selected, kind of work on this for a while, and then I can go back to the display and then just uh, show all, you know, get everything back. So uh, keep those in mind when you're working with multiple objects like this too. Yeah, sweet butter knife. It's, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty dull at this point, but we're going to fix that. So what you can do is you can grab all your edges or vertices. I think what I'm going to do is grab my vertexes, my vertices. If you have a camera just floating in your way, uh, you can just turn them off. You know, just go to show, just uncheck cameras, and then you're good to go. And then I can grab all the vertices that are along this edge here. I guess I should, yeah, we'll stay that for now. And then now that I've got them all, I can scale them in towards each other like this. It doesn't have to be like a super sharp edge, again, because the detail is going to kind of get lost. But you can do something like this. Same thing here. I think we're going to scale this down a little bit. 
I think along this edge we're just going to taper everything down. Uh, you can individually grab vertices if you want, that's fine. I usually do something more like this though. Okay. And we'll just kind of let it kind of form a linear progression as it goes back towards the tip. So now we have something that's a little, a little sharper right in here, and then we can slide the hilt towards. And then we have something, you know, very basic, very basic weapon that we could put in his hand. However, um, because this looks a little bad, usually what I like to do is I like to use the smooth modifiers that are inside of Maya to kind of, even if it's a stylized knife like this, to kind of um, clean things up a little. And the way you do this is kind of unique. So basically what you can think of this like, you notice I keep toggling between um, one and three. So one is no smoothing and three is one level of smoothing. You can see I keep a polygon count up in the upper left hand side of my screen. This is showing you that everything is basically getting increased by a factor of four. So we go from 32 faces, or 22 in the case of this, this handle, to 352. So really increasing the number of faces on this knife. But uh, it's smoothing it really hard in a way that makes it look nothing like a knife anymore. So what we can do is we do something um, called putting in edge loops. And what this helps us do is hold this information for where we want things to be sharp. So if I go up to my mesh tools up here, you see I have this insert edge loop function. What I can do is I can put them in wherever I want things to stay sharp. Hold up one sec. You can open your options for tools in Maya by double clicking on them on the left hand side. I'm gonna actually do equal or relative distance to edge because then I can control where they go. So I can put something like right here if I really wanna sharpen that edge and I'll show you what impact these have. So real fast, we're just gonna put one in here. And before, remember how much it was being flattened if I go ahead and hit three, let me quit out of the tool real fast. You can see that suddenly that edge is being held a lot sharper. So you kind of have the actual edge that you're looking for. And the reason for that is because we put an edge in here to hold kind of the shape. So you notice that it's right here and it's being put off. So it's being smoothed, but because there's an edge right here, it's holding a lot more of that detail than it did uh, before we put that edge in. So you can use this to really hold the shapes that you need. So like if I wanted to hold this sharp hilt on the bottom here. Let's see. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, chime in as well. I just saw your connect, uh, question, it's pronounced Cav. Um, so how thin? Yeah, it does depend on your printer and it depends on what you're printing. So. Something to keep in mind that where I'm going to kind of want to be um, for all my details is I don't want anything smaller than one millimeter. Like that's my absolute cutoff. Um, what I'm intending to print on is say like the um, Lulzbot menus that we have in the Hillmaker space. I'm kind of considering the mini to kind of be around those benchmarks. Um, really you want to go thicker than one millimeter. You probably want to go closer to two millimeters in thickness uh, if you can. Yeah, one millimeter, just like Colin said. Um, but generally that's kind of what you want your minimum to be. Uh, I think two is way safer than one, so I try to always keep my smallest features around two if I can. Um, and then that's kind of another point I want to make up, that if you're sculpting minis in this way, because you're going to lose a lot of detail, and because um, just from the printing process and because you need to kind of think chunky when you're modeling, uh, don't be afraid to like thicken things up because it probably will make them look better, um, you know, like once you are actually like printing it, um, bigger things show up better. And like if you try to put too much um, detail into your models, you're gonna, you're just gonna, <laughs> you're gonna lose the details because either they'll be washed out or you just won't be able to print them uh, because the nozzle will be too large. So just keep that in mind when you're working that um, chunkier is better. And if I feel like I need to make a change, like say this blade is too thin and it might be, uh, sorry if I'm making anyone sick. I have a habit of rotating around things constantly whenever I'm working on them because it really lets you see the detail from like all sides. 
if you're working in 3D, you need to kind of be able to view something from all sides um, because that's the only way you can tell how it looks in 3D. Otherwise, you're looking at it in 2D. But if I need to thicken it up like this, I can basically just scale everything up. Yeah, and then get the thickness I need to actually uh, thickness I actually need to make it for my objects. So I think that's a good point. I'm going to thicken this up a little bit. If I'm worried that this edge, uh, this knife edge, is getting too thick, I can just come back in here, you know, with my vertices. I can also um, grab these faces. This is actually probably the fastest way to do it. I can come back in these faces, like here, and I can just scale them in because you're just scaling those faces themselves. And then you're kind of jumping back and forth between the smooth view and your solid view, and then just kind of finding out how everything looks. Yeah, that's not too bad. I think I can live with that. Okay, and then if you wanted to add um, some more detail, now that you're kind of working in here, this would be a good time to do it. So say you wanted to curve you know, the blade more, you could do this just by moving the vertices around. You know, like it's not a big deal to kind of do it like this. And kind of keep in mind that when you're doing this, um, that everything is going to be averaged because again, you're using this smoothing modifier. So you can kind of put it in however you want. Like even though it looks kind of blocky, you know, like in these segments right here, as soon as you apply the smooth modifier to it, um, things look fine. If you want to, you can also see both at the same time by hitting two on your keyboard. Um, you can toggle between your views in Maya by hitting one, two, three. Um, but I find that this is kind of weird once you kind of have the cage, the model inside the cage and it's kind of hard to grab what you want. So I usually toggle between one and three and just kind of see how it looks. I think I'm going to step back a few steps and I'm going to go back to before it was curved. If I did want to curve it, I might go the other way, but I think this is fine. Again, I'm doing this more just to put something in his hand and just kind of show you um, that when you're working, it's good to have something in the character's hand because it'll give their fingers, which are very slender, something to merge into, and then you won't lose their hands or their fingers because um, all of a sudden everything has been thickened up. Yeah, it's a bad butter knife, much better dagger. Still kind of has this Lego block look down here at the end, but we're gonna do the same thing that we did um, to the knife itself to the handle. So first thing is you can move it in here you can position this manually, um, or you can use the align tool. There is an align tool inside of Maya. If you come up here to edit, I believe, might be modify. Yeah, under modify, sorry. There's the align tool right here. And basically what this is going to give you, if I click on it, is you get a series of boxes. And it changes based on where your view is, but you can click the middle one. Basically, um, I don't want to do this one, because if I do that, it's going to snap into it but I may want to do, let's see. Not this one, just trying to find my vertices. This one right here, that's what I was looking for. Okay, so I can then align it straight to the middle if I need to, but you can also kind of eyeball it in this case. Um, it doesn't have to be exact. So what I'm gonna do is just scale this up until I can actually, whoops. You'll notice that my um, modifier is actually at the bottom. This does make a difference. So if I ever need to center it, which I want to do now, because I want to scale everything out uniformly, you can just go here to modify center pivot. Um, your pivot point in Maya can always be moved around. Basically, you just hit the D on your keyboard, and then you can just like kind of snap it wherever you want. So if I have it here, you know, like I can move it down here. You know, I can move it to the corner. I can move it to the bottom. I can snap it to the vertices. But um, just in the center is usually all you need, and it's a good place to have it. But there are times you may want to move your pivot point somewhere else. So I can scale this up now uniformly, and then maybe scale it down a little bit, scale it in a bit. You know, we just kind of want to make a knife where it's covering, covering the hilt. And it's fine that it's blocky. Again, it can be very simple. In this case, uh, really, you're just making it so that your, your mini has something to hold on to. You can put as much attention into these this stuff as you want. 
Um, it's up to you. Let me real fast. I don't like I don't like the, how the edge is curving back in. Actually, we're gonna we're gonna thicken it back up a bit. So I'm gonna go back to my top down view. I'm just gonna drag these vertices out. Uh, quick tip is if you hold down the V key or click this button on the top, you will snap to other vertices, and then you can basically just hold down V and then move it, and it will just snap in that that direction. And then I can even drag these out a little bit if I want. Yeah, something like that. I think will look a little better. Okay. Take a look, make sure everything looks good. And then we can stick this inside. Yeah, something like this. Thicken it a little bit more. Okay. And then that's a perfectly passable dagger uh, for all intents and purposes. And then we can go in as well and we can add holding loops to this just like we did the knife. So mesh tools, insert edge loop tool. And basically you're just gonna throw these in all. The way I like to think about it is you're gonna you're gonna lasso each corner. And what I mean by that is um, you know bring bring your cowboy talk into modeling. Basically what you're gonna do is go to each edge, go to the corner vertice, and make sure that it has a box kind of drawn around each edge of it. It's very simple on like boxy meshes like this. So now it's been lassoed, air quotes. Uh, no one says that except me, so don't use it as a technical term. But now you have this vertex surrounded so you know that it's been completely kind of covered and the smoothing will apply correctly. So now if I go to my object mode, you'll notice that I do kind of get these smoother edges on there. You can also always change these after the fact, like you say something looks too smooth or not smooth enough. Um, you can select your edge, double click, and you can just move it closer to the center. And a good way to show this is actually um, on the smooth preview. As you move it in, you'll notice that your edge gets less smooth. You actually get a softer edge the further those um, holding loops kind of move away from it. So like if I move this one towards the middle too, like all of a sudden you have a much softer corner than you do on the other side. And all I did was just move these loops um, away from, from the main edge. So if you want like a softer looking knife, and we'll do a little both, how about that? We'll make one edge soft, one edge sharp. I think I actually want the opposite edge to be the soft one though. So we'll move those back. And we'll grab this edge. And all we're doing is just pulling these loops back. That's all we're doing. If you want to do it uniformly, you can also use your scale tool right here, and you can scale them uniformly at the same time. If you want one edge to be um, softer but not the other edge, yeah, very nicely lassoed. Thank you. Let's see. Um, if you want one edge to be sharper but not the other edge, what you can do, I'm going to use those display tools I showed you in a second. I'm going to hide unselected objects, Alt H. So say we want this edge to be you know, softer but this one's to still be tight. All you need to do in order to do this, I'm going to grab this edge right here. is just um, vary it across the surface. So like, because you're using these vertices, you can still keep this one very close to the edge and then you can gradually soften it as you go down. So as you do this, and you can do this on both sides, kind of as you do this, this edge will still be very sharp, it'll have sharp corners and these edges will be softer because you've just moved them further away. So it's something to keep in mind uh, that as you work is that you can kind of change the, the holding edges like this as well. So now if I preview it, you see I have a fairly soft, more rounded corner on the front and this uh, harder edge on the back. So we can use this as our hilt. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, the more complicated your objects get, the harder this will be to do. Um, just for the reason that you won't have these nice like edge loops to loop around. Like, uh, sorry, if you have like a box going through here, 
Um, the second I start adding like extrusions, you know, like like on top of these or things like that, suddenly that kind of gets in your way and you may not like that detail in one place, but it's just something to keep in mind that um, this is kind of a good way to work in Maya. But yeah, do keep in mind that it gets harder to manage your topology the more complicated it gets, and that's why it's a good thing to do this right at the start. Um, like I said, keep things simple and then detail them. Okay. All right, and then we will show uh, that which was lost. So I'm going to go to show and show selection. You have your sh uh, hotkeys here. You could just do shift H, but I'm just going to show you where it is. Whoops, sorry. We're going to show everything. Um, if you want to know where everything is in your scene, you have your outliner right here. Right now, I just gave everything a default name because um, I'm bad and unorganized. But if I was doing this correctly, I would have said knife handle and then probably blade. And then that way I can kind of keep track of everything in my scene and it will all show up here in the outliner. Okay. All right, so I think this is totally fine for my intents and purposes. Um, you can kind of do whatever you need to do. Like I could make this blade longer, you know, I could make this uh, more detailed, this hilt more detailed if I needed to, but I think for all intents and purposes, this is just fine for what I want to do with this character. So the last thing you need to do is before you export it, uh, keep in mind that none of this geometry that you've just made, this nice and smooth geometry, is actually there. Uh, your model still just looks blocky like this. You can see it's poking through the sides because it hasn't been smoothed down. So what you need to do is go up to your mesh, and then right at the top here you have this option to smooth. And then what that will do is what that smooth preview has kind of been showing you this whole time, this will actually make with actual geometry. Like it'll put in the faces that you need in there. And then you have, uh, if you need to export it to any kind of other application, it will actually hold that shape. Because this preview is only inside of Maya, it's something to keep in mind. Um, if you want to take it out of Maya, you'll need to apply, apply the preview. And you do that just by hitting smooth. If you wanted to, um, kind of like we talked about in the sculpting one last week, you can just keep increasing the divisions. Like this is two right here, but I could make it three or four. Um, there's no reason to really. Like this is totally fine for what I want to do, but if you wanted something really smooth, you know, with a lot of faces, you can just keep subdividing it if you want. But I think this is totally fine. Do -do. Can you add uh, ergometric finger grooves? How hard would that be? Well, let me show you. Um, so we can do it right now. I think I'm actually, so here's also another good point, like if you're doing this kind of modeling. So remember I said you want to start um, simple and then go to details? Uh, sometimes you want to break that rule, like rules exist to be broken. Right now I don't have the geometry in here to add finger grooves, but let me show you. If we go ahead and mesh and smooth it, all of a sudden I have a lot more stuff to play with right here. And then now that we're adding ergometric finger grooves, you know, kind of to this mesh. Let me go to a side view. Yeah, this will work. Okay. So I'm just going to start grabbing my finger grooves to be. And then now that I have this geometry, what I can do is I can just start extruding them, you know, extrude, extrude the finger grooves. And then if you look at it kind of in this view, or uh, what might be even better is to kind of cut them into the surface, something like something like this, um, which here looks very blocky, right? But as soon as I turn on my preview, you know, I can like take a look for something like that. Um, this is a very quick, uh, this is a very quick pass, you know, kind of of how, how I would do this. Um, Really, I would go in and like touch things up a bit. Like, let me go back here. So, like, you might want to let's go back to the extrude itself. All right, cool. So, when you extrude, you have a couple of options, basically, just to show. Um, I think it's funny that we're gonna spend spend this time on uh, ergomet ergometric goblin finger grooves, but it is cool to show. So, we'll extrude, and then you have this thickness option down here. Um, and this offset option. These are both done locally, 
So if like I tried to um, scale everything right here, it wouldn't look good. But because I have this offset and thickness option, whoops, let's go to offset. You can see I can kind of scale these in on themselves. By default, it's very sensitive. So I usually don't um, just scroll through here. I actually punch in some numbers. So if I want to say 0.1, something like this, then I can kind of scale it inside itself uh, in this way. Um, I could also you know, do it the opposite way or put it in or out. But this kind of gives you a starting point to work with in here. And then again, you can kind of do um, the same thing that we were doing earlier is like if you want to hold these finger grooves a little bit more, we still have that insert uh, edge loop tool. So what we can do here is we can actually throw them in here. Oops. So just kind of to show what this would look like. And then now if we go back, all of a sudden what was like a very, um, you know, kind of light finger groove, and maybe that's what you're going for, uh, is now like that shape's really held. And you can like kind of look at it in comparison to the other ones. So if you want to, Oh, that was that was a that was a quick yeah you can do you can do a lot of stuff pretty quickly like um, if you if you need to change so like um, you have a lot of freedom with uh, surface modelers like this you know like that's kind of the the kind of the trade off is they are um, much less exact you know it's like much harder to do like exact measurements exact movements within them like spacing things exactly but you do have a lot of freedom um, with like how to uh, like place things. You have a lot of artistic freedom. Like it's easy to make things, it's easier to make things look the way you want them. Um, so that's kind of the advantage and kind of why I use it uh, for some things. At this point, I kind of use a combination of everything. I feel like like my workflow has like nine 3D packages in it and it's kind of this like Franken workflow that like I would not encourage anyone else to follow. But, um, but I feel like everything has its like strengths and weaknesses and you can, like always take like a few from each of them. Yeah, so if you wanted to, you know, like there is your <laughs> ergonomic, you know, kind of goblin knife. Um, you could spend a lot more time on this, just kind of like pulling the vertices around, you know, like uh, I usually go in my top down view for this, but like, you know, something like this, you can like drag them out. You can like drag them out, like kind of like this, you can like widen them. You know, and then like all these are going to be mirrored, you know, like in your in your preview. But really just the more time you put into it is like, you know, the better it's going to look, I guess, is kind of like kind of the answer. But um, <laughs> if you're just looking for simple, tactical, ergonomic goblin grooves, you can you can put them in. You can also add like fun things, you know, like a, let's see if you need to get to another camera view in your orthographic, you can hold down spacebar get to this menu with way too many options, but click in Maya right here, and then it gives you all the cameras, like right here. So, what is, I think we're like in left or right view here. Yeah, there we go, that's what I'm looking for. And then right here, you know, I can go add this in. Usually I'll go into my perspective to make sure I'm not like adding everything on the front, but something like this. And then I can extrude, you know, like out like some kind of like hilt thing, you know, and very soon this knife will look very uncomfortable to uh, hold, you know, like, like the more, the more and more we do this, you know, like the more tactical, uh, like aspects will add to it, but like you can make a lot of changes like that pretty quickly uh, and move it around. But yeah, I guess we'll, I guess we'll export this finger groups and all. And then I'm just gonna take this and something I always like to do, um, you almost never run into this like in an actual application, but um, Maya kind of saves all the inputs that you have made to the object. Um, so from our humble beginnings as a plane, you know, all the way down here, polyplane two, to our final, you know, like tactical placements on the grip of the knife, like on the split ring or all the way up here. Usually I actually like to delete all of that before I export an object, just because you don't always know how uh, the importer that you're bringing into is going to handle it. So um, under here, edit, you have a couple options, delete by type, and you can delete your history um, because it will hold on to that if you don't clear it. 
So I usually just knock that out before. And you don't have to do this one by one. If you go to edit, you can just go delete all by type and history, and that will remove like um, that whole history off of every object in your scene. Um, if you wanted to hang on to it, and I'd recommend that you do like for long term, um, you I would save your scene first before deleting it all off. But um, since we're just exporting this, I think this is fine. The last thing we can do um, to make sure that everything works out okay is we can combine this mesh into one object. And then now, like any time we mess with it, it will be one tactical knife and not a hilt and a blade. Um, generally with 3D printing and most applications, it's totally fine to combine things. You don't need everything to be like one solid mesh. Like if I go inside it here, you can see that, um, you know, like we got this Tron view of our knife. Um, you can see that it's just like another object inserted into another one. Generally that's totally fine. Like. Um, as long as they are completely, you know, like within each other, um, you shouldn't have any printing errors. Uh, basically, the STL is going to look at the outside surface and it's going to kind of disregard the stuff on the interior. So just something to keep in mind that you are totally free to just stick things inside, you know, like other ones willy nilly, like it won't it won't impact your final STL. Other things might. Um, and actually, I would kind of advise you to not uh, do what the following. I'm going to kind of show you something. So like let's say we made a cube and we have to be very exact with this but let's say that we wanted to um, so I'm going to snap this to the vertice like down here and let's say we wanted to like line this up completely flush with this surface so I'm going to just go down here so now if I look at this You'll notice it doesn't enter it at all. It's actually right on top of that geometry. I'd actually encourage you not to do this. Um, this will probably confuse um, any printer or STL reader more so than just intersecting the objects. Um, like it can be fine sometimes, like you can get away with it, but just keep in mind that if you are like putting objects together like this in like a surface modeler, I would actually stick it in just slightly like just so it's intersecting the surface just a little bit um, because you may run into errors if like they're completely flush with each other so um, keep that in mind that if you're using multiple objects you know for for printing or creating like that that you do intersect them a little bit okay so we'll delete that and then we're gonna go ahead and export our knife so I'm just gonna go up here you get your menu with too many options but all we need is this export selection And I've got a folder on my desktop called Sculptor's Assets, and I'm just going to throw it in there. Um, you have a lot of options to export, like anytime you do any kind of 3D modeling. Um, in general, a very um, robust one that's going to be used by a lot of engines is this OBJ export. Most 3D applications that can edit uh, 3D files can take an OBJ, so it might be good to use that one just because of its versatility. There's lots of ones that are more efficient or carry more information with them, you know, like textures and things like that, but OBJ is used by so many 3D applications that it's, um, it's a good practice to kind of start there and then adjust it if you need to, especially if you don't know what kind of... Um, file you're going to need in a 3D application. So we'll use the OBJ here and we'll just say knife and we'll export it. Our tactical, <laughs> our tactical goblin knife. And then we're going to go ahead and jump back into SculptGL. So let's go back here and I'm going to go ahead and transition us. Whoop. There we are. Okay, now kind of I just want to show you to place things in the scene. So import the file. You can just hit this add button at the top and look we've got that OBJ um, that we can use. So we can say knife OBJ. Most likely what's going to be the case is that the knife is too big, although here it actually it looks decent sized. Uh, we'll have to scale it up a little bit, but that's not too bad. Usually it's way too big or way too small because different 3D applications have different scales. Uh, so 
what is small in one application will be huge in another. Like it's just based on whatever the default unit is. Sometimes it's meters, sometimes it's millimeters, and if you go from one where it's in millimeters and one to one it's in meters, uh, your stuff is all gonna be very small. So we're gonna transform this real fast. We're just gonna scale it up uniformly. Remember, you want it a little chunkier because we're gonna do this for 3D modeling. Um, so we're gonna make it maybe a little bigger than it needs to. And then you can also just flip it over. This doesn't need to be too exact because we're gonna end up rotating it to better fit in his hand anyway. Generally, I wouldn't even try to fit this in his hand until we were done posing him. I think we'll do a very a pretty rudimentary like kind of pose of him just to kind of show you the steps to do it. But I don't want to spend too long on it because we'll also need to get into Mesh Mixer and kind of show you different ways. So you can kind of, you know, kind of turn it however you need. <laughs> this might be a little too big. It's a little comically large. But again, chunkier is better. So don't be afraid to make it big because you need that detail to show up. And if you feel like the tip or anything is like um, is not large enough, you know, feel free to jump back into Maya, you know, like if you need to, and then like make the adjustment there. But I think this will be good. I'm just kind of taking a look around it. Also, don't worry too much about getting it exact right now because we're going to move his fingers, you know, around it anyway. You can also make, you know, like non-uniform uh, scale things, like, and it's usually not that noticeable. So if you find like you need to lengthen the entire thing, you know, don't be too afraid to just take it out until it's a, <laughs> until it's a sword, you know. Um, at some point it will start to look goofy, but you can actually get away with quite a bit, you know, just by scaling it. Okay, yeah, something like that. Okay. Now before we pose him, um, there's something that you're going to run into that's kind of an issue in SculptGL. And I would, I would pose him inside of SculptGL. Like you have a, diff a bunch of different options for posing him, uh, but we're going to stick inside this program for now. So right here, um, the main things you're going to actually use to pose him are this transform tool. And I'm going to kind of show you how this works here in a sec. Well first. Because we're posing him, that means we're going to break symmetry for the first time. So for the first time since we started this project, we're going to turn symmetry off. Because we need to move things non-uniformly. So you can use the move brushes to kind of move him around, but you're going to run into an issue, and I'll kind of show you what that is. So anytime you do this, you're going to notice that things get very, um, like, spaghetti-y and it's hard to rotate like because I'm moving his like arm forward but like you see his fingers are kind of like melting behind him and things like that and the further you go kind of the worse it is you can get around this a little bit by um, doing this in short bursts Oops. I don't want to do too many and that will kind of preserve your things a little better but you'll notice that my fingers are still like you know kind of breaking or going with the flow a better way to do this, let me just walk it back, is to actually use this um, transform tool. But if you try to use it, you know, <laughs> with everything selected, you're just going to move him out of his clothes. So what you want to do instead is mask out everything. So what this looks like is if I kind of apply it, and we'll make it a lot bigger, is you want to is you want to mask out basically everything that you aren't, you don't want to pose. So we'll just turn this off, move this out here, move this out here. Okay, so we'll start with this. He still might have some geometry underneath his shirt that isn't masked. Sorry, we'll do it one more time. I just want to make sure. Because you're basically using your mask tool, you know, to kind of go in here and just mask everything out. And then what you can do, once everything's masked, is use this transform tool. And what you can do here is because 
everything is moving uniformly, you have a lot more freedom to kind of move stuff. And I know this looks weird, but what you can do with it is that you can also rotate everything. So I can move like this a little, and I can scale this in. Oops. scale this in and I can like rotate up at the elbow or things like this and you're kind of kind of have to go like back and forth as you go but like you can start like positioning his limbs you know I'll go like this and then what you can do is go back in and like let's say like now I've broken his arm <laughs> ooh painful I can go back in with my mask brush and basically I think about this as being like, um, you know, think about like where you have like natural breaks in your body, like the wrist, you know, things like that. I can go back in to his wrist. Let's go a little higher. You can also um, hold down control alt to like remove the masking. Whoops. To remove the masking. Yeah, something like that. And then I can go back in here and then I can reposition his wrist with the same tool. So I've got like the transform tool. And I can like scale it up, you know, and then like move it out and scale it up and move it out. Kind of things like this until you're kind of getting, you know, like kind of the poses you need and things don't look terrible. Yeah, <laughs> the poor goblin. Yeah, when it was just getting cut off. I mean, we can do that, too. I can show, I can show you in a little bit. Well, we're going to be cutting him apart in a little bit. But basically you're gonna do this on the joints. And then um, once you have some stuff roughly in the right position, like say like I roughly want his um, arm to be up like this, that's when you go back in with your brush and you just have to re-sculpt. You know, like now I can go back in, I can um, get my smooth brush, I can smooth it down, I can lower the resolution if I need to, smooth stuff out. and get my move brushes if I need them. But basically you're gonna go back in and then kind of fix what you've done. Um, and then this is kind of the point part, you know, like where you're like, oh, but I just sculpted all that. Well, it's like, you have to kind of go back and fix it. Like you took advantage um, because the alternative is that like, so you can do this two ways. You can, you know, kind of sculpt in a T-pose like we've been doing, um, kind of taking advantage of the symmetry wherever you have it, and then go back and fix it after you pose them correctly. Uh, or you can just start without symmetry from the start. Um, and I actually think it's a lot less work is if you take advantage of the symmetry, you know, kind of get everything where you need it symmetrically and then go back and fix it. Um, but you can do it either way. But um, either way, you're, you're going to be doing a lot of like asymmetrical sculpting at some point. And then you can also grab your move brushes, you know, like in just like we were doing like on the first one. You can just start kind of fixing, kind of fixing that geometry in there. And basically you just kind of do this like across all of his joints. You know, like you can you can put this forward, you can rotate his head. Let's go ahead and do that. Also, if you want to, you can kind of um, just grab your move tool and see where it takes you. Uh, I kind of like this because you can get stuff like this happening, you know, but like you can also get stuff like that happening. So that's why I encourage you not to just only use your move tool um, because you'll kind of get away from everything. Yeah, asymmetrical sculpting <laughs> for breaking goblin. I mean, you know, that's kind of what we're doing here. You, you are, um, you, you get to play God kind of in this scenario, you know, like you can do whatever you want to your model. You can do all kinds of crazy things to it. So real fast, just following the kind of the example I've been showing. Let me grab my masking brush. Is there an option to flood it? I was almost wondering. No, I don't think so. Sometimes with your masking brush, you get an option to flood everything. Um, if you want to flood things here, you have to do it the old-fashioned way by getting a really big brush. But yeah, there we go. And then from there, when everything's masked, you can just scale down, and it's a lot easier just to unmask his head rather than it is to 
fine tune it. So things like this. So we've got his head out, and then we can use the same transform tool that I was using earlier. And you'll notice one thing is that uh, the props don't follow, and we'll need to fix that before we go forward. But you can kind of see here, I'm just kind of showing you an example that like, you know, kind of whatever you need to do, you can kind of do it in this form. So we can twist his head. And then we'll just return it. And slide him back a little bit, yeah. You know, so like if we wanted to do things like this, like you kind of just get the um, the idea for any time that like things need to be posed, you know, you're just kind of picking your pivot points, in this case his neck, masking everything around that, and then repositioning and rotating with the translation tool. And you really want to do it this way because again, if you use the move tool, just everything's kind of gonna sag behind. And then once you're done and you kind of have something that you like, you can go back in, unmask everything, and you can kind of start cleaning it up. Things like this. Smooth it out. Use your move brush, kind of slide things around. Um, and remember, his eyeball fell out. Um, actually, before we get into posing it, uh, something that I would recommend is that you to export it as an OBJ and bring it back in. And the reason for that is it's going to um, group everything as one mesh, and then you can just handle it that way. So I'll, I've already done that, but I can show you. So I kind of like the pose he's in, though. You can also just move his eyeball around if you want, but that gets kind of tiresome. Um, let me save this real fast first, because I kind of like where he's at. Maybe I want to come back to this. But then um, I can kind of bring in clear my scene. I can go ahead and bring in what I've already exported. So what I would do is export as an OBJ, uh, save OBJ out of here, and then I would just import him back in. So if I add my OBJ, goblin OBJ, we're going to give it a second because he's kind of a big mesh. Oh, that's not it. Sorry. Add OBJ. Sorry. Goblin combined OBJ. <laughs> we'll get rid of this. Give him a sec to come back in. Okay. And now he's going to come in as one mesh. Um, so basically everything will follow uh, what you've done the first time. We do lose all of our nice color information. So he's no longer a green goblin. Uh, he's just a goblin. But now if I try to move him around or anything like that, everything should stick together. I don't know. You know, oh well. Let's see. I was sure that would help, but it didn't do it. Oh well. If you need to, you can also just remesh everything. If you do that, though, make sure that your um, resolution is pretty high. So I'm going to go ahead and see what I get. Do, 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 do. We're just waiting on the remesher. Yeah. And sometimes the only bug with this is it like does things like take away his pants and stuff. <laughs> yeah, a pink fleshy goblin. Absolutely, you know, like everything, like his shirt is very skin colored. Mm. I'm just gonna stick with this one for now, the first one that I had. Um, one of the reasons that like the stuff may not um, act well is that it's too thin. So something that you can do if you are looking to uh, increase the size is that you can go to your inflate brush, kind of pick the one you need, and you can start like pushing everything back in. Because if there's kind of a gap between, um, like here you kind of see there's a gap in here, if there's a gap between like his clothes and his skin, the remesher uh, sometimes doesn't work like it's supposed to. So you can also come in and like poof it out a little bit. And then all we're trying to do is make things intersect. <laughs> I 
He'll start wearing a thicker coat than he was, but that's usually okay. Oh, also, since we've broken symmetry, if you want to start doing some cloth sculpting in here um, without the restriction, the tyranny, I should say, of symmetry and how it works with cloth sculpting, um, you can always do this at this point too. So if I like came in and then like wanted to actually like actually do some cloth sculpting. Like I could start doing this. Because again, like uh, doing cloth work and having it be symmetrical is, is where realistic cloth goes to die. So like you can get a lot better result if you spend some time here afterwards, uh, after you break symmetry, kind of like improving, improving your cloth. I'm not going to do too much of it though because I want to kind of concentrate on getting him to a more finished product. Man, that's I just noticed that he's a goblin it might be skin. That's pretty dark, you know. This is this is not how this goblin rolls. Um, but once you have something that you're kind of happy with um, pose-wise, I'm going to go back and grab my other one that I had started posing. I think he should just be sitting in my downloads folder. Yep, your mesh form. <laughs> There's the two of them just sitting there together. But we can take that one out. Once you have something that you're happy with, you can go ahead and uh, export it. And I kind of want to show you basically where you're going to take it and what you're going to do with it at this point. First, though, I'm going to relocate this guy's eyeball. So I want to pop it back in his head. Okay, just place an eyeballs and head. Just another another normal day. I feel like I spend a lot of my time like doing characters and stuff, uh, putting eyeballs and heads. I'm gonna make him a little higher resolution. transform we're just gonna keep moving whoops there we go this is also where I would duplicate this eye over to the other side Let's see and you can do this a couple of ways. Copy selection right here. Yep. And then when you paste the selection, and while I was having an issue with it, I wonder how many eyeballs are here. No, just one, okay. And when you paste it, it's going to paste it exactly where. Um, you put the first one, so just keep in mind it's not going to pop up. So you can copy Control C and then paste Control V, and we can give him two eyes for the first time in his life. Yeah, something like this. Okay, cool. Again, you can also pose anything else you need to at this point. This uh, knife is very large. I don't know when this happened. Okay, <laughs> we'll slide it back in. Oh, and yeah, one thing I said before is that if we're gonna go ahead and use this for our final pose, it is good to wrap his fingers around it. That's very important. So just doing some positioning. And then I'm going to grab him and grab my move tool. And we're going to slide this in. For this, I think you can use the move tool because we're going to do more 
broad strokes yeah something like this and if you break it you know just move it back it's no big deal you want his hand to actually be intersecting uh, the prop that you're going to grab let's step this back a bit you want his hand fingers to actually be intersecting or touching the prop he's going to grab because we're going to use this um, geometry as kind of a helper because what this is going to do is when we go to print it instead of printing one very thin finger it's going to pr print one thicker fist holding an object so all this plastic is going to work together in order to preserve these um, fingers because 3d printers um, print can print a couple of things like there's a couple of things that are considered when you make a print there are features which are you know small points that aren't load bearing they're not um, like kind of held up on their own they kind of just come off the surface and you can actually make features very small like much smaller than you could um, like an actual structure of a 3d print so we're gonna kind of make these fingers features instead of something that needs to be load bearing and then we're gonna mask off actually it's always it's almost always easier to kind of mask in reverse like instead of like trying to mask off everything except what you're working on well what I always advise is mask what you're working on and then click control click off and then it will just invert it and then you can come in here and you can kind of move things if you need to rotate um, I still recommend using that transform just because it just makes it so much easier to like hold things together Ugh. the only issue I have with this transform is that I really wish you could move the pivot point because what you can do here if you could you could move it right here and then just like pivot it like a finger but it's kind of stuck on the mesh so that's just a limitation you have inside of SculptGL so won't won't but we'll go back to just moving things around not to spend too long on it because sometimes they're just things that you need to spend time on uh, if you are moving things like this use a small brush move in segments and don't worry if it looks like this and I'll show you why in a second and then move often rather than like moving once kind of move it like this because then at the end what you can do is smooth everything out and then you can go in and grab your inflate brush scale it down and you can return life to his fingers then clear your mask and you can continue to move and this is something that just takes time so don't be afraid to just spend a little bit of time on it and again if things look weird just grab your move brush like this grab your smooth brush and then kind of put it where it needs to go so this is all you're kind of doing and you're going to do this for each of his fingers until everything is good his finger looked like toothpaste it did for a bit yeah stay in school kids or your fingers also might look like toothpaste if you want to you know like extend this out uh, a little more you can again just use your move brushes slide it around make sure you pivot around things again don't worry if things get flattened because it doesn't matter you can just use your inflate brush and like you'll just return life to it um, another good brush you can use at this point is your flatten brush so if you do need something to get flatter like if it curves weird um, you can grab your flatten brush and put it in like that too I think this needs a little more volume but again anytime that you think something needs more volume like the inflate brush is your problem solver like you can come in here thicken it up grab your move brush Oops, not your brush sorry your move brush and you can start scaling it in and basically just get it to something that you're happy with you know it's however you want it to look this is your happy little goblin 
Like that's always always what I want to say. You always want to you always want to channel a Bob Ross vibe when you're doing something creative. Again, if you feel like it's too thin, just thicken it up and just go until it goes in. But it is important to make sure that it is intersecting that mesh because otherwise like you don't even need to put something in his hand um, because it won't matter. So again, I think he could use a little more help here. Just gonna slide this finger down. And I'm not gonna spend all my time like kind of placing his fingers in place um, just because like I have a few more things to show you. But again, you'd want to put objects in his hands and you'd want to make sure that they were thickened and in contact with everything. So here, you'd want to slide his thumb down. Something like this. Yeah, and make sure that the full hand is in contact with it because if not, you're um, not going to do it at once. And again, spend some time fixing it up. You know, like look around his hand. Make sure everything's scaled right. Make sure none of the tips are getting away from you. Things like this. Yeah, that looks good. If anything ever gets too flat, like this is looking, you're gonna just grab your inflate brush, as big as you need it, inflate and smooth, and just kind of push it back up. Inflate and smooth. inflate and smooth until you kind of get the volume you need. And again, don't be afraid to just kind of re-sculpt any kind of that detail if you need to, and then you can kind of go ahead and uh, place everything you need. Okay, and then I'm gonna go on, because we're at 4.30, I kind of want to show you what you need to do to do the next part. So I'm gonna leave it at this for now. Again, you just want to spend the time that you need to um, Get the pose how you want, you know, reposition the things in his hands, um, and then make sure that you do have something there because it's just going to help so much. Like, like this whole area, you know, you can see how much we've thickened, like what the plastic would need to be as opposed to just like one of his fingers. So just make sure that you do have something in their hands or you have their, like they have, you have a fist, something like that. You can even abstract it if you need to, kind of like I have his feet, like I don't have any toes here. Um, that's totally fine like if you need to abstract their hands um, that's fine as well a lot of times like those details don't always come through when you're 3d printing so don't be afraid like of don't be afraid of like losing them okay so what I'm gonna go ahead and do now is I'm gonna go export this full model as an OBJ I'm just gonna say save OBJ Okay, and you have your mesh one dot obj. So I'm going to keep that in mind, and I'm going to open another program. Oh, one second. We're going to use Mesh Mixer, which is a free uh, free program that you can download from Autodesk, and basically it's very good at preparing files for 3D prints, and it's also very good for setting up other. Uh, like other mechanical things that you want to do. So I'm going to go ahead and import him. He should be in my downloads folder. Yep. Your mesh one OBJ. We'll open him. All right, there he is. Just laying on his back. So we could change the axis of rotation if we wanted to. You can transform him, kind of stand him up. So we can rotate him 90 degrees to switch the axis. We can put him on top of the grid if we want. It doesn't really matter. And we just accept. Cancel that. Okay. Okay, so here is our goblin. You kind of see his full face. He doesn't have a base or anything yet, but we can add that here. All right, so the first thing you have is the option to mesh mix. So I can add something like a cylinder and like put it underneath his feet um, or things like that and do my bases this way. 
If you want to, you can also do your bases um, after the fact. Like you don't have to use a base. You could print him like he is now and then add him to a base later. If you choose to do it that way though, what you're going to find is you want a solid base for his feet. Um, because right now you would need support material underneath some parts of this because his feet are not completely flat. So just to show you some tools. Oh no! Let's see, we'll say okay. Do, 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 do. We'll put it in. Let's see if we can save it. I don't know if you just saw, but the sculpture has just crashed, which is very sad. Yeah, we'll continue. Okay, so let's see if we can save it. If we can't, that's okay. We'll just import and uh, go from there. It may be that he's too complex. It might be also that I'm running Sculpt GL, Maya, and Mesh Mixer all at the same time. So I'm gonna go ahead and kill Maya, I think. Okay. I'm not gonna spend too long just waiting on this to come back. If it doesn't, um, I'll just open, close it and open a new one. And we'll take some steps. Uh, okay. Oh, that's a bummer. We'll close him. Let's try this. It's never good when your uh, application crashes on stream. So I'm just going to open Mesh Mixer. Uh, we'll say don't restore actually, and then we'll import him. And then from here, I'm just going to go to my fo my folder. Do we save him? Let's see. He may be a little too complex too, so I can show you um, what we can do as well if we need to. Because we can also decimate him uh, if we have to, and then we can you know, keep him from crashing a mesh mixer over and over again. All right, so just waiting on it to generate. Don't let me down, mesh mixer, we can do it. Oh, I think it's gonna let me down. Womp womp. Yeah, I think we have to. I think we have to kill it. All right. I'm sorry. The goblin just keeps crashing. Uh, real fast. Something you can do if you are finding everything like there's too many vertices in your in your scene, you can um, try knocking them down inside of Sculpt GL as well. You have this reverse feature where basically you can knock things down if you need to. So things like his shirt, you know, which may not need as much detail. Okay, let's try one of these. I wonder if I remesh it though. Let me see. Let's knock this back down. Let's go like 100. What's this look like? Oh, nope, they just disappear. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, I'll leave it alone for now, but you can also try remeshing objects inside of Mesh Mixer. Um, like and knocking it down that way, like if things are too high, because you should have like subdivision levels. Um, the ones that I imported in here are having trouble because they weren't generated inside of Sculpt Geo. But um, keep in mind that for your main one, like the goblin itself, like I can reverse him and knock him down. I lose a little too much detail right now, like he doesn't really have a face anymore, so I'm going to hold off on that, but um, it is an option. Okay. So I'm going to go back into Mesh Mixer, and I think I've got the formula this time. We're going to import him, uh, not from the saved version. We're going to import him from my downloads folder. Okay, your Mesh, yep. I'm going to bring him in. Because this one worked a lot better than the uh, STL tried to save. 
We're gonna leave them like this for a second and we're actually gonna go in and decimate them a bit. And to do that, we'll go select. And basically I'm just hitting A or control A in here to select everything. And you have this reduce option. So we're gonna go in. It's gonna to have to take a sec to think about it, so we'll let it do that. If it looks like it's crashing or any, oh man, let's see. Hmm, okay. I didn't think that it, like, half a million faces is, is a lot. Was well, it even that many? Yeah, I'm only displaying 59,000 faces. I wonder where they're all coming from. It's probably because uh, it's probably because of all the objects together in the scene. That's my guess. So what I'm going to do is just kind of to show you to get to the next point. I'll show you how um, I would go about doing this. Like uh, like if I was running into this problem, which I am, um, I would show you how I'd go about decimating everything so that it works all together. Because I think I just crashed it again. So we're going to kill. Oh, it already killed itself, okay. So if you are running into this issue, what you can do is you can save out your master SGL file, which we already have. And what you can do is you can knock down the polygons, right? So like I can start here and we're not just gonna leave him naked, um, but this is kind of like a starting place. So now, because I just have him, you know, like his knife and his eyeballs, I can basically export what I need like in this scene and then not have to go any further. So yeah, we took off his clothes, but then we can export him as an S as an OBJ. So I can save him out as an OBJ. And then basically what you can do is you can bring them into Mesh Mixer piece by piece. So rather than like, um, rather than just this one, you know, like coming in or like all of them coming in at one time, I can bring in this one. Downloads, your mesh two, open. So I just type him by himself. And then I can come up here to mesh mix. I can select everything. And then I can modify, whoop. Do, 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 do. Go up to edit, then hit this reduce. And then basically, because now we're only dealing with his model, you know, instead of like all the models in the scene, we can go one at a time and um, kind of get the object we need to. So from here, I can choose an option so we can go to 50% as our try count. And we can accept. I'll give it a sec. And it's just going to knock down basically these vertices. So if you take a look, he actually has a lot less than he used to. And if you need to, you can do it multiple times. Like I could also go reduce him again if I need to. And then as many times as I need to to um, get him within a poly count that like actually works. So again, we can knock it down. We could go more aggressive. You know, we could go to like a triangle budget instead. Right now it's at a thousand tries. That's pretty low, but you can see what we'd get. Like we can preview it. But basically, yeah, this is what a thousand triangles looks like. Uh, so a little low for our, our, our intents and purposes, but you can see a very reduced model <laughs> if you want to go that route. So this scaled it down to about 18,000 faces. So you can kind of see that that still looks pretty serviceable. But um, you can also input a number here if you need to. So 15,000, whatever you want to do. Whatever still looks good, but also gets you the results you need. We'll make sure we're at 15,000 and not 150,000 because that's not the way we need to go. Yeah, so you can play around with this. Um, once you're done, you can say accept. And then basically, once it's done, you can bring everything in piece by piece the same way. Um, you can also save these out, like if you're nervous about it. 
yeah i mean yeah it's not too bad at a thousand triangles like i just i just notice it that like you can you can piece it down and see um you also have you know various options to show uh one of the things is again um this is an argument for doing it this way if you cut off his head you know you can actually bring his body very low like i think a thousand triangles for the body would actually probably be fine the only thing you'd have to watch out for are his hands is my thought um but other than that like everything probably looks okay um, it's just that the head needs a lot of detail because it has a lot of features and a lot of recognizable features so um, just keep that in mind that when you're putting things down um, just pay attention to your smallest points and then just kind of go down until you get to what looks good and then from here because we saved everything out we'll go ahead and clear the selection okay so we have him right here yeah still looks pretty good didn't lose much detail um, you can go back in here and you can always just go back to that uh, same what's seen that dot SGL that same sculpt GL file and we can just keep importing it so we can clear this out we'll add our SGL scene I think we actually have it is it still saved here let me go ahead and open it yeah there we go everything's oh his eyeballs aren't in it hold on i'm pretty sure we have a contemporary sgl scene that we can bring in if not that's okay but i'm, I'm pretty sure i've got one let me see if i put it in my sculptures folder goblin fixing sgl if not we'll just go back to that one because we already have his stuff yeah let's just go back to the the saved one uh always save before you do this kids so we'll clear the scene add the one in our downloads folder the most contemporary one and we don't care about his eyeballs because they're already in the scene but now we can take everything and we can delete this out delete this out and then we can grab his shirt like this um, we'll do one at a time yeah because what do we got shirts not too bad the pants are the pants are pretty high. hundred these are hundred and seventy six uh, hundred thousand polygon pants, folks. But then you can just kind of take these one at a time. So we can add this in. So we can export this out as an OBJ. Um, I'd rename it something rather than your mesh, so I know that it's there. But then we can import it. We'll append it into the scene, and we can add this in now. So everything is going to. Uh, kind of go back in where you need it because it's going to you know interpret the scene information so you don't need to worry about like dragging it around every time so you can bring each of these in one at a time and kind of um, get them and reduce them where they need to be and then you can still go to the same process select everything edit a remesh might be good on this one because it looks like it's showing some non-manifold geometry errors so we may want to uh, try a remesh here. Let me take a look. You can kind of get an idea. We'll say accept. All right, and that has also taken care of most of the errors. It looks like there's a couple right, there's one right there, but I think that's fine for me. And then you can go back in and reduce it and you can just follow these steps, you know, for any number of them. And you might find that you have to do this. Uh, does Mesh Mixer work better to combine these these two pieces? Um, like in, in what way? I'm sorry. Uh, like, so I just saw the question, um, like rather than doing it in SculptGL or doing it in another application. Just hit this with maybe... And I'm just adjusting my percentage down a bit. Uh, I would always recommend that you, if you're dealing with dense meshes, to make sure that you type everything in because the second you drag it, it's going to try and update. And then, um, and then once it tries to update, like it'll give you a loading time. Okay, so we're gonna head remesh this down to 20%. And basically, you can keep doing this, you know, like until until your your models and meshes work well. Um, 
what time we got? We have 10 minutes left and I want to show you some things about basing. So we're going to stop here. We're just going to give him a shirt. Um, but again, I would just keep importing these and I'd follow the same process. Import one, remesh it, uh, reduce it, and then get it to kind of the, the polygon count you need. Um, so real fast, I'm going to edit him. Oh, when you tried to remesh. Um, I think that happened for a couple of reasons. So SculptGL, right here, I am remeshing um, an individual item. In SculptGL, I was trying to combine all of the pieces into one item. So it was trying to merge his shirt with his body. Um, and here, I'm just trying to repair the shirt. If in SculptGL, I tried to remesh just the shirt, I think it would have looked a lot better. Uh, so I think that was part of it, is I was really just trying to merge everything together. So from this point, I'm going to go into my edit and we're going to do some transforms uh, real fast because we want him to be one piece for this. Because if I try to, if I try to uh, transform him now, it's just going to be the shirt. Um, we're going to join them together. So you can click both of them and transform this way. That's one option. You can also merge them back together if you'd like. We'll just hit them at 90 degrees. Okay, there we go. And then we're gonna stand them up a bit. So remember I said at the beginning that you can use, um, you can print him in the base separately. Miniatures often have bases with them. Um, but what you can do is you can print bases separate and then glue him on after the fact. If you do want to do it that way though, you'll need to get his feet flat. Uh, right now I don't know if you can see, but not much of them is in contact with the base. So there's a really handy tool inside of Mesh Mixer. Sorry, let's accept the transformation. There's a really handy tool inside of Mesh Mixer um, that's called Plain Cut. For this I don't need the shirt, I just need him, if you go to edit and plain cut right here, what it's going to give you is it's going to give you basically uh, a slice. So it's going to go across the entire body and wherever you choose to use it, it's going to cut it kind of in half or kind of cut down all the geometry below that. So it's moving in 2.5 degree increments right now. second. So right now I'm just trying to adjust my grid. Da, 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 da. Usually my meshes are larger. A quick way that I can fix this right now, because you can modify your increments, right? Um, but a quick way, if you want to change it, is you can just scale up the whole model, like because it doesn't it doesn't matter. So I could go to like um, units dimensions in here, and like I could increase them to like 155. Something like this, and then say done. Um, and that's like kind of a workaround. Normally you can readjust the increment size. I'm just kind of running for time and I want to show you like these, these features real fast, but um, just keep that in mind. Okay. And then I can come in here, go into my analysis, whoops, sorry, my edit. And I can use this plain cut feature. I can scale this down. Sorry guys, I always hate being like stuck in there. But you can um, adjust like the level of plane cut. But right now when you go in to do it, if you use like the discard half, basically everything, <laughs> basically everything below 
is going to be um, taken off. So like if I needed his feet to be cut right here and I hit accept, basically it's going to generate a flat base and you're going to lose like whatever is below it. Yeah, it really wants to cut off his feet. And you can, like I mean like, and then this is also useful in a lot of other ways too. Like let me show you, like if you wanted to cut off his arms, um, and this you may want to do this actually because sometimes it's better to cut things like uh, at an angle, you know, like print pieces separately. So what I can do is like come up top right here. Hold up, I'm gonna flip it back a bit. What I could do is come up top right here and like say I want to cut off his arm. And when I say cut off, I don't mean <laughs> cut off, cut off. But basically make a split right here. You can use this plain cut feature to just separate out the geometry that you want to. And you don't have to discard it. What you can do is you can slice it, like slice groups right here. And what it will do, except, is it will generate two separate groups. And then what you can do from this point let me lose his clothes. What you can do from this point is you can separate it off. Oh, I'm gonna run out of time before I can I can show you everything. But if I just go a little a little bit longer, I think I can give basically give you the idea. So now that you have this group, you can select the arm point. And basically you can take this. Oops. and you can separate it. So now what you have is you have two meshes. And if you go to edit and take your transforms, you can take this mesh that you've split off from the base mesh and then you can fill in the holes. So let me show you real fast. So if I go to analysis inspector, it's gonna say, hey, <laughs> there's a big hole in this mesh, but I can auto repair both. And now I have a good fit right in here. You can also go in. Blah, 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 blah. Um, keep in mind you're going to have to do it for each side. So analysis, if I do the inspector here, it's only inspecting this mesh, auto repair all. But I can click on the other one, sorry, this one, and do the same thing, auto repair all. And then now I have two pieces of geometry. Um, and then what I can do from here is I can select one and we can go to mesh mix and I can grab, let's say a cube and put it in my scene. Scroll down the dimensions. Something, let's say something like this. We'll go ahead and accept it. And what you can do is on both of them, like we can go back to the other one. I'm just kind of showing you how to do this. This is real fast, you guys, I'm sorry. I just wanted to put it in before we have to uh, stop for the day. Is you can do the same thing on the other side. You'll want to remember the dimension of the first cube because what you're gonna go in here to do is instead of appending it, you're gonna use this Boolean subtract and basically what you can make inside a mesh mixer is you can split up all of your models um, so that you're printing individual parts all at once and then you can combine them together through these boolean subtractions and additions. Um, I wish I could have like, what you'll want to do is when, as you do this make sure that you write down the, um, the different, like the size, the scale of the, the mesh mixed cube that you put in. You actually don't have to worry too much about how far it indents because it will indent exactly half of the width of the cube. So if you put one here, it'll stick out half. And if you use the same size, it'll indent half. So you can use these to generate um, like quick and dirty like inputs for it. I would recommend that you go down slightly in size. Don't use the same exact one um, because uh, you want to give your pieces a bit of a tolerance, especially in FDM printing. But this is a quick way that you can kind of split up your mesh if you want to do separate parts.
Yeah, no, it, it actually works really well, and um, you can do it really fast, and then it works simply. You also don't have to put in pegs, like in this way. It does perform a better bond, but if you're using something like plastic glue, um, just doing it flush is usually enough, but the pegs really do help if you need like that little extra bit of adhesion. Um, for doing a base, if you were going to print bases on here, you'll basically follow the same steps. Um, you'll mesh mix out a cylinder, put it on the bottom, and then you'll just scale it down. Uh, so it's not super complicated. Find your scale. And I want to keep going, but it's about time. So um, you kind of get the idea. You would then scale it down if you want it, you know, like oval. You can kind of generate whatever base you need. And then you can make sure that your thickness is set up and is OK. Um, I would encourage you that if you're inputting a base like this, make sure that it's flush. It's the same thing. You want his feet to be flat into it. But here, since you have control over it, you can kind of scale it into his feet if you need to. So I think generating something like that will go. So once you go to prepare your miniatures for 3D printing, um, you just want to slice things up. Like in that way, if you think you need the detail, you'll want to base them, and then you want to go from there. So I hopefully showed you, I know I'm running a bit over, but I wanted to kind of <laughs> showcase this even if I'm kind of uh, running through time real fast. I just kind of want to show you that when you go through, you can create split off parts, um, add them after the fact. And it's basically through just use of the planar cut and the mesh mix tool. And then you can basically prepare them for 3D printing. Most, um, most smaller miniatures do not need to be cut off, like their arms and segments. Uh, usually you can do them with just supports, but as you get larger, um, there are times you may want to cut pieces of your model off and print them separately and append them. So just kind of think about things like that. Things with big overhangs, like these arms, you know, you're going to have to use a lot of support material in order to hold these arms up, especially as the model gets larger. It's usually much easier to just cut them off, print them separately uh, with minimal support material, and then attach them in post-processing. So just keep that in mind that when you're creating things, again, not too big a deal if your thing is very small because you're using minimal support material, but the larger you go, the more you want to think about how to cut up your model and kind of like where you can go to do that. So just keep that in mind, and I hope this helped you and kind of gave you kind of an inspiration for how you can start making and modeling these kind of miniatures on your own, uh, walking you through everything. And thank you so much for joining us today. Sorry for going over, but uh, I really wanted to get everything out of the way.